I wasn't sure what I was going to do in, through college and beyond, so I didn't take much math the first couple of years. vacation uh, around the, the visiting all of the national parks and stopped into or not all of them there's 60 of them but um, going on my way to the Grand Canyon right now and rented a hotel room so that I could interview uh, so I could do my um, interview with Robert Michael Robert Michael is a professor emeritus at the University of Chicago Harris School uh, and this is part of a larger series uh, that I have, kind of this mini-series that may go nowhere, um, that I'm just calling Becker's Students, uh, named after Gary Becker, uh, the Nobel Laureate. Uh, a lot of people associate Gary Becker with the University of Chicago, it's where he did his PhD, it's where he spent a, the bulk of his career. But for uh, the earliest part, his first job um, was at Columbia University, and he was there for, I don't, I want to say 12 to 15 years or something like that. and. The crop of students that uh, came out of that, the, the crop of work that came out of that time at Columbia University included, um, I believe, the, the work on human capital, uh, crime and punishment, economic approach, work on political uh, public choice type work, uh, work on, uh, I believe even, well, e even the work on the family. I believe the book, A Treatise on the Family, did happen at Columbia, but a, a lot of this, you know, the, the, the work that you associate Becker, his discrimination work is his dissertation at the University of Chicago, but a lot of this other stuff really is, happens at Columbia. So it's a really interesting period of incredible productivity, but it's also inc interesting because there was a group of students uh, in the early 70s, early to mid 70s, uh, that came out from that time with Gary Becker uh, that have just that just have these incredibly impactful careers. Michael Grossman, who I've already interviewed, uh, one of the sort of the pillars uh, of health economics. Um, Robert Michael, who I've interviewed today. Uh, Isaac Ehrlich, the uh, Elizabeth and Bill Landis, um, and, I, and I'm forgetting other people. It's just, there, there's also other people at the University of Chicago too. Shoshana Grosberg, who I'm hoping to speak with. But uh, the, the Columbia time is really interesting. And so uh, I wanted to do this series because I I am a, just an absolutely, you know, uh, Gary Becker, as well as Al Roth, and people like Hito Imbens and Alberto Abadie and Josh Angers have, have been very, very impactful for me personally. Uh, but each in really different ways. And um, so the, the the Becker series is just a way for me to kind of reconnect with a lot of my people that I really admire uh, that uh, and the work that they've done. But Robert Michael in particular is a person I have a real connection with. I've never met him. Um, today was my first time to even ever talk to him. Uh, Robert Michael, uh, was the PI on the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth 1997 and the NHS LS, just to name two surveys that he was connected with um, in this affiliation that he had with uh, the National Opinion Research Center, NORC. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on uh, the NLSY 97. I studied the NHS LS for a project on sex work that I did and in the NHS LS, uh, he, he also wrote a book uh, with Ed Lauman and Gagnon, John Gagnon, called The Social Organization of Sexuality. And it was sort of based on the NHS LS that was done in 1992. That, that survey was contextually uh, an effort to understand the sexual behavior of Americans, American adults, largely in response to the AIDS epidemic. Um, we knew very little about the social, the sexual lives of Americans. And if you don't know anything about the sexual lives uh, and the, so the social and sexual lives 
of sexually active people during a, a, a massive epidemic like AIDS, it's really a public health catastrophe and uh, waiting to get worse. And so they, they did that. But it was also interesting because uh, it, 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 it's a, it was the first effort, successful effort to get a random sample of Americans to actually tell surveyors about their sexual lives. Uh, and he goes into detail and talks about uh, how he man how he and the others managed to do it, and it's just a beautiful story of um, of just being curious and respectful, and and uh, uh, and being a safe person. It, it, in many ways, it, it it's it's a story that I think reminds me that a lot of the lines between scientific work and and ethical living is is sometimes not as different or at least they're of, they might be drawn from similar uh similar source material so robert michael is a hero of mine uh i've always admired him i've always looked up to him as a role model uh because i was also interested in sexual behavior as an economist and i was also obviously uh very much interested in data and and, and analyzing data uh, as well as collecting my own data and so it's just a real privilege to get to talk to him he's a he's a real inspiration and i hope that you uh enjoy this this interview it's uh my pleasure today to get to talk to a, uh, an economist that i have had a long time uh, admiration for robert michael um thank you so much for being on the podcast dr michael delighted to be with you scott uh before we get before we get started, um, I was wondering if you could just tell the listener your name and uh, your back, uh, your 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 background, and where you uh, what institute you're as associated with. Sure, my name is Robert Michael. I'm a professor or a professor emeritus at the University of Chicago in the Harris School of Public Policy. Um, trained at Columbia, taught at uh, UCLA and Stanford before coming to Columbia or to Chicago in 1980. You were at, um, so you, you started off at UCLA and then went to Stanford or was it the other direction? No, that, that's the right direction. I uh, graduated, did my orals or my PhD exams in uh, 68 and started teaching January 3rd of 69 and taught at UCLA a few years. Then I left UCLA, went back to New York with the National Bureau. And then the National Bureau went to Stanford and opened an office West, NVER West. Mm. And so I went out there to be co-director of the West Coast office of NVER and stayed there through the rest of the 70s and moved in the middle of 1980, July 1980, to Chicago to the Department of Education uh, to be there economist to teach economics of education. And mm. so I've been there since 1980. Oh, okay. Wow, that's great. Well, that, that's things I'd love to learn more about, to, to ask you about. Let, before we dive into your career, um, can you tell me where you grew up and, and you know, what was it, uh, what, what were you like as a, a, a kid? What was I like as a kid? Probably a little geeky. Um, <laughs> I grew up in, um, southeastern Ohio uh, in Appalachia and what are called the Welch Hills of uh, southern Ohio. Uh, last name Michael, but it once was Jones and his ancestor of mine named Michael Jones decided there were too damn many Joneses. So he flipped his name and we've been Michael ever since. Oh, wow. So I grew up there, uh, went, went to grade school there, had a terrible time in high school and uh, left uh, my home at, for my junior and senior year of high school at Western Reserve Academy up near Cleveland, outside of Akron. And then from there, uh, went to Ohio Wesleyan University. Yeah. And from Ohio Wesleyan, went to Columbia for graduate school. Do you mind me asking what, what made high school such a bad experience or what, what happened? No, no, and I feel anxious, worried about the kids that are st still in uh, 
Appalachia taking mm. their schooling. Um, I was a fairly large kid, not super large, but decent. And I had a job after school in the afternoons and on Saturday had to work. So I couldn't play football. So the uh, football coach who also happened to teach mathematics, but he was really the football coach got mad at me. It wouldn't talk to me in class. So I'd come home from school every day, sophomore year crying because my teacher wouldn't acknowledge that I was in the room and was being nasty. I thought because I wouldn't play football. So schooling was really bad. So I went up to this other little school, lovely school, Western Reserve Academy, flunked every one of their admissions exams. And yet I had been an Eagle Scout. Oh. And as an Eagle Scout, the nice people at that school decided, well, Bobby's not very smart and he doesn't know shit, but he seems to have something on the ball. So let's give him a chance. So I was on academic probation at first and worked my way up to halfway along in the class by the time we graduated in a couple of years. And I've served on the board of Western Reserve for the, the last 20 or so years as recognition or uh, thanks for uh, their getting me out of Appalachia and onto a better trajectory. Oh, what a great, that's, that's, uh, that's the kind of thing. I guess if you could go back to that kid uh, in high school, what would you say to him right now? If you could, if you could go sit with him. Uh, study hard and get out because <laughs> in the sense that there are no good job opportunities in an awfully lot of that part of rural, uh, Appalachia mm. and, um, to better oneself, have a good life. It's uh, helpful to get well-trained and then to find a job someplace and go with the job. Yeah. I have moved several times as I'm sure you have, Scott, as we find the, the best next job and take it and work hard at that one and move along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, was it, did, did that uh, negative mathematics teacher experience uh, make you less interested in math? Because, you know, being an economist, you have such a strong math background. Uh, no, no, it was more a social, psychological and substantive subject area. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do in, through college and beyond. So I didn't take much math the first couple of years. Mm. But by my senior year, as it was clear what I might be doing, I took as much math as I could get, and yeah. that proved uh, really important um, at Columbia when I got there, as we, yeah. we might talk about in a few minutes. So yeah. it's often the case, and I, in the little book I've written recently on the five life decisions, stress that the decisions you make at one point have important consequences for your life later in ways you can't anticipate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, studying birds and knots and canoeing and getting an Eagle Scout was nothing that I thought would perhaps help me with schooling. Yeah. But it did. And the same later, the mathematics that I took was essential into getting into Gary Becker's courses. So little things you do at one point have big impact on your life later. So, yeah. you know, be careful, choose well, and right. be a little bit strategic. Right, right. Uh, Columbia, when did you, how did, t can you walk me through how you became first interested in economics and then how you ended up at Columbia University? Yeah, I had majored in economics at Ohio Wesleyan along with a major in philosophy. Oh. And so when I got, uh, I guess, what, junior year, see, near the end of that year, I took some uh, GREs and philosophy and economics, as well as the law boards. I didn't do well in the law boards. That kind of ruled that out. I did really well in the philosophy boards, but I decided uh, kind of a risky career to become a philosopher. I was never the smartest kid in any class, and so I wasn't going to be some profound philosopher. Mm. So it seemed to me of the three tests I'd taken, economics was the prudent way forward. Mm. So by senior year, I knew I wanted to do more 
graduate work and in economics. Mm. As for Columbia, I applied for and got an NSF, um, I think it was called a cooperative fellowship that uh, paid my tuition through my graduate program uh, at Columbia. I applied in conjunction with them. And um, so I went to Columbia because I got this NSF fellowship. Oh, Didn't wow. know much about it. I'd never been to New York. My mother took me. Uh, we heard on the way over that there were two Lincoln tunnels and we were so worried about which one we should take because neither of us had ever been to New York as yeah. we were driving. And it turns out it didn't matter. But, and Columbia turned out to be a, a fine place to be for several years. Yeah, you enjoyed it. What, 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 yeah. what was the most striking thing about it for you coming from, you know, uh, a more rural uh, yeah. growing up? Uh, you hit it. Uh, coming from where I was to New York City was just an amazing yeah. transformation. I, I guess the reality was, though, that the courses, the studying was hard enough that I spent most of my next two years on Morningside Heights up on campus studying. Mm -hmm. And I didn't run downtown very often, but uh, it was it, it just an amazingly lovely city to mm -hmm. spend some time. I, I married after a year and my wife worked in New York and then we stayed on at NBER. Mm. It had an office downtown and Mike Grossman and I both worked down at the NBER, which was sort of linked to Columbia's economics as in fact, you know, it had been linked very closely through Arthur Burns as mm. a professor at Columbia and as the head of NBER. Yeah. Do, do, you, um, do you remember the first time you met Mike Grossman? Well, um, Mike and I uh, started at the same time, ended up, I think we had almost identical course loads that first year. Mm. And so I would have met him the very first day of classes. Yeah. In both Becker's price theory and Jake Menster's statistics mm. and probably uh, somebody's macroeconomics and something else. And Mike and I lived uh, in the same dorm. Oh. We lived on campus at, yeah. in John Jay Hall. And so we connected. And so we, you know, ate occasionally together, go to classes together, had all these problem sets we had to work on all the time. Yeah. So we became very good friends, uh, inevitably, right at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell me about Dr. Becker's first impressions on you? Um, well, I was scared to death. I don't know about him, but I was scared to death. Um, I was shy and not uh, super articulate. Hmm. And the funny thing was, uh, Gary called on people by name. He'd take the reading or the, the list of people and he'd say, Grossman, who's Grossman? Uh, <laughs> Grossman, you know, what's the answer to that question? So he'd call on people. And every week we had a problem set that uh, he encouraged us to work on together, mm. but to write up separately. And so there were a group of, I don't know, six to 10 of us who would get together on Thursday or Friday and spend quite a lot of time thinking through what the hell the problem meant and why it had anything to do with anything we were studying, because that was always part of the challenge. And then, you know, by Friday night, we had a sense of what we collectively thought. And then we'd go out and write it up and turn it in on Tuesday. Yeah. I, I was good at that. I could write yeah. well. I could think decently. And my, I got very high grades. Bill Landis was our uh, uh, grader. And I invariably got a very high mark on those. And so after a couple of weeks, Gary started calling on the good students. And I was so scared, I could hardly tell him my name. Um, I don't think I answered any of the questions correctly the whole first term. It, he'd call it Michael. And then it, some awful question. And I had no idea what the answer was. I was so scared, I couldn't write down. I couldn't take notes. But that weekend, I'd write a really good paper, and the next Tuesday, Gary'd see that, gee, that guy Michael did well again. So, damn it, you know, is <laughs> he a blithering idiot or is he okay? So he called on me all year. It was terrible. So, <laughs> um, you know, it was 
uh, quite a challenging experience. Yeah. It affected my teaching, Scott, in that I always had much more compassion yeah. for the students I had in class because of that uh, discrepancy between my capacity to learn it and know it and use it on the one hand and my capacity to quickly uh, articulate and link, uh, which I cannot, could not, cannot do, never did. So um, teaching was something I loved to do of all the various things that one's career. My favorite was being in a classroom with 30 or 40 kids and a well-designed lecture, yeah. engaging. And that was not what it was with Becker. It was serious learning. He was a superb teacher. I, I loved the course at one, in one way and was scared to death of it in another. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, how, so, so can you elaborate a little bit more? The, how were you, how, how would you describe to someone who's never been in your classes, your philosophy of teaching? Or your philosophy of being even in it? Yeah, your philosophy yeah. of teaching. Well, it evolves, but in the last 15, 20 years of my teaching, I always tried to think of it as dyadic, me and him, me and her, me and him, me and her. Always gave a little part of a lecture in the first of a course, telling them that it, my limited understanding of the matter is that we all learn very differently. Some of us learn um, from mathematics. Some of us learn visually from a graph. Some of us learn from the logical syllogism, from the, uh, some learn gestalt, the whole thing. And ah, now I see the picture and I can learn it. Some learn piecemeal from piecemeal. Yeah. So in any course, I try to decide what it is about this subject I think you need to know. Yeah. And then I'll go over it two or three different ways. And so you're going to be bored part of my lecture because you're going to think I'm repeating myself. I'm not repeating myself for you. If you got it the first time from that graph, someone else will get it maybe from that math or from the logic of it or from some other connections of it. So my job is to know how the 30 students are learning it and to try to teach each one of them a little bit separately. Yeah. Best part of that was I always used, as, as Gary did, homework every week and write it up, turn it in, and I read your answer and yeah. gave you an answer back yeah. for the next class time. And as a result, I got to know the, the, the way in which different students approached a topic and learned a topic and what their orientation and their, their knowledge base was. Mm. So I could feel partly that I was teaching each, interacting with each separately. And I think that dyadic one-on-one, -on -one, um, not necessarily Socratic, not necessarily coaxing mm. it out, but having a conversation with as many in a classroom as you can, teaching yeah. less stuff more thoroughly yeah, does a better job. It also means as a teacher, you have to decide before you start into price theory or cost structure, mm -hmm. what it is you want him to know uh, six months later, right? So that you can limit it to what it is you think is important. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I can hear echoes of your experience with Dr. Becker, that, you know, calling on you and uh, doing homework and things like that. But this kind of, you know, intentional connection with each person seems really uh, unique or I don't know if it's unique, but I can hear it in what you're describing. Well, in the same way, we're all different in how we learn. Yeah, I'm sure we're all different in how we communicate. And mm -hmm. Gary was a superb communicator. Mm. And boy, you know, no question about his understanding of the material, of his intellect, of his penetrating capacity to go deeply. But his way and my way were really very different, as 
is true with you or Mike or anybody else. And so you kind of have to figure out for yourself as a teacher, as well as as a learner, what works for you. Yeah. And that that I found as intriguing, in fact, as was the subject matter itself. Yeah. So I always loved the teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Finding your voice and finding out who you are uh, is a big part of being an effective teacher, especially if you you know, it can be challenging if, if you're if a lot of your professors are Gary Beckers and they kind of are drawn from a similar part of the distribution, you know, and yeah. you're not like them. It's it can be a lot of searching to sort of figure out who you are. Um, yes, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a Bible st story of uh, David uh, when he was going to go fight Goliath and the king gives him a bunch of armor and uh he just can't wear it. Yeah, it, no, it, it's he, not gonna work. He'd have been crushed. He'd have been crushed if, if he had all that on yeah, yeah. a big steel. That's right. Uh, That's sword right. he couldn't lift, but he give him work. a give him a little. Uh, what you call it? He did really well. <laughs> little, yeah, little rock. I know it's funny. You know, I mean. Uh, that's not discussed enough. I feel like that's a huge part of growing into our careers of figuring out who we are. Um, and, you know, being able to learn from a superb professor like Dr. Becker and then, and then knowing you're going to become your own self is this a real skill, a real part of personal discovery. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit about how, you know, how you, so one of the things that's interesting about Columbia at your time is just the sheer number of really impressive students that that came out from under, you know, came out, came out from Gary Becker's uh, mentorship. You, Mike Grossman, I, I think of the Landises, uh, yep. uh, Isaac Ehrlich. Were you all in kind of a, a the same at there at the exact same time? All those people I named? Um, the Landis's bill was a year or two ahead. Lisa was not there. I, th I think sh she might have been a, uh, I don't know uh, uh, whether Lisa, she was a student at Gary's. I don't know if it was at Columbia or Chicago. I, I worked with Lisa a lot later. And one of my best articles is one that she co-authored with me with Gary oh, on uh, divorce. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, Becker, Landis, and Michael. Um, it, uh, one thing I want to uh, uh, add to your uh, view of this, and that is, I think we at the time didn't think of it as we were students of simply Becker. It was Becker Menser. Yeah. Uh, Jacob I Menser. Jacob Menser taught statistics that first year, all year, as we took Becker's price theory, Menser's statistic. The right. second year, the second year, Jake Menser taught the full year of labor economics. Right. So we all took that. And then there was the Becker Menser workshop mm. on a like a Thursday afternoon. So we were all Becker Menser students. Some mm. of us then wrote primarily for Gary, some primarily for Jacob, but we were both. And the, one of the reasons the group learned so well and did so well was the lovely difference and in interaction and complementarity of the two. Gary was primarily a theorist right. and wonderful models and theory and always always took that theory to real life evidence. Jacob started with the evidence. He was the empiricist. He looked at the statistics. He, he was the statistician. He was the one that was focusing on the empirics right. and then always taking it back to some theory. So you wouldn't say one or the other was more committed to the theory and evidence than the other but the one stressed the one, the other stressed the other. Together, they made just a, a nearly perfect mm. uh, dyad, complementary in every way. And so in that second year, we started going to the workshop 
And by the second, and third, and fourth year of sitting there listening, Gary on one side of the speaker, Jacob on the other, both of them dealing with whatever the topic, we learned how important that integration of theory and evidence was. Most of us would quickly say, need none of us, any one of us was quite Gary or quite Jacob or quite able to do what they taught. But we learned that's what one should do. That's what works. And we all got so much better at it because of that long, uh, several year exposure to Becker Menser. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, that kind of dyad between him and Jacob Menser is just legendary. I've always heard about the, the labor workshop being just this really, uh, you know, really important workshop at Columbia for a long, long time. But I didn't quite realize the, the theory data piece. What was it like in that workshop? Do you, do you have many memories of that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was the high point of the week after the first couple of years. You know, you're in graduate school, what, four years, five years, and the first two, you're taking courses. And then at Columbia, you had an oral exam that uh, got you certified. And you started working on papers. And those papers, the the convening of the Becker-Mentzer workshop was where each of us came every week and stayed connected to one another as well as to them through yeah. someone giving a talk about his or her paper. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you try two or three different papers out over the course of the first year or so. So uh, lots of experience. Um, yeah, it was the defining uh, element in our training, I think. And yeah, um, Linda Edwards was a part of that, Arlene, Leibowitz was a part of that. Cool. It was a fine group. Mike Lom. Mm. Um, yeah, Isaac was in our class. Uh, uh, Barry Chiswick was a year ahead, I think. Um, Ruben Gronau was a year or two ahead mm. of us. Um, Bill Landis, well, I think one, I think just one year ahead. It was a remarkable group. Wow. Columbia, Columbia, uh, my year accepted 75 PhD students. Wow. And um, gave us a test when we got there, a math test, to sort us into three groups. And the top group studied with Becker, Price Theory. The second group studied with um, um, Bill Vickery, who also got a Nobel Prize later. Wow. And I, I forget who taught the third. But that's what partitioned us into these groups of about 25. And we, the 25 that were with Becker, then mm -hmm. stayed together. All 75 of us were probably in Mincer's courses in statistics. Mm -hmm. But but we were the group that came from the Becker side and had these god awful problems every week. So we got to know one another as we yeah. got to know economics. Wow. Wow. Wow, there's so many pieces uh, of the production function that you're describing. Uh, there's the, the 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 close chemistry between complementary chemistry between Dr. Becker and Dr. Menser, and then um, uh, or uh, J Jacob, uh, and um, then there's the labor workshop, and then there's even the sorting that happened. You know, I yeah. mean, it, it, it's interesting because some departments don't have any sorting mechanism. They may not be, you know, they may be so small that they just kind of, yeah, you just kind of go wherever. But I guess that sorting, that sorting mechanism is pretty crucial when you have a size of 75 and you recognize yeah. the complementarities. You, you think that, that that was, that was that something that Chicago did also? I think Chicago also had more than the average number of uh, PhD students. I've forgotten now, but yeah, many schools uh, were much more selective and harder to get in and much more homogeneous and then much more likely to get out. You know, we all knew that of the 75 of us, if 20 of us got a PhD in five or six or seven years, that'd be a lot. Yeah. Many, many came to get sorted out. They'd get a master's, they'd go on. 
Right. And that, that worked fine. And it, it allowed those of us that were not so great at testing mm. to have an opportunity to show we could. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not unlike my experience in high school where I flunked the exam, but they took me in and right. I ended up OK. You know, at the end, I did graduate middle of the class. So you don't want to rely on those admissions tests exclusively. And it's wonderful that there are at least some universities that have the other model of mm. we'll let you in, but we have high standards right. and you may not make it through. But right. still, yeah, I, we all admired that, liked it. And um, there wasn't a sense of arrogance or of superiority there was simply a sense of, oh, my God, this is hard. And we, we, we've got a lot of work to do with this Friday. Yeah. I yeah. understand what the hell they're talking about here. Right, right. Well, so transitioning a little bit, um, when, when did you, I want to talk about NBR, but I, I, I have these big things I want to talk about. So maybe I'll save NBR at the end. But the, the data sets, I don't think a lot of listeners probably are aware of how many data sets you have your finger you have your fingers in. Can you tell us a little bit about your history with data? Well, that starts with Becker Menser. If you're going to write a thesis, you're going to have evidence. Hmm. And the kind of thesis that I had, that Mike had, that Arlene had, that Linda had, that Mike Rong had, that Isaac Ehrlich had, that we, any one of us had. We had to have data of some kind. Mm. Uh, some, uh, Isaac's a great example. Isaac was looking at the impact of, um, uh, I think, incarceration on murder rates or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And that's one kind of data. That's administrative data. I was looking at uh, how the level of schooling that a person has affects their his spending pattern and the efficiency with which he makes decisions outside the labor market. Mm. Thesis was if schooling enhances your ability to be productive for 40 hours a week, it probably isn't irrelevant. Yeah for all the other hours of your day and therefore what you do in the evening what you do in the weekends what you do uh everywhere in the kitchen in the bed they're yeah. all influenced by the efficiency the, the the whatever it is that works from schooling so i needed data about how people spent so i used a big data set the consumer expenditure survey yeah. uh from 1960 i think in my dissertation and um uh, Arlene Leibowitz and I had a fun experience later in our time at Chicago, at Columbia. Uh, there's a, a man, Lewis Terman, a psychologist at uh, Stanford, who wrote or, or uh, in, enhanced the Stanford Binet IQ test, mm. and, and later undertook this, a study of geniuses. And mm -hmm. did a, a longitudinal study starting in 1921 that went for practically 100 years of following the top two or three percent of the um, high school kids uh, from California as geniuses and a sample of geniuses through their lifetime. And as Lewis Turman got older, he took the um, uh, a royalty from the Stanford Binet to continue to survey his sample of genius is well beyond his lifetime. Mm -hmm. So Stanford psychology department has that data. They sent us their data because Arlene and I wanted to write a paper using geniuses and it came on IBM cards. You know what, an, <laughs> are you old enough to know what an IBM card looks like? A I've heard about them. Yeah, I've seen them in pictures. Yeah. Now, most of your readers will not, but you used to have all your data on a little piece of a cardboard and there were 80 columns and typically one column would have one hole punch in it yeah. and that would give you a number. Well, the folks at Stanford had been very efficient and put four or five variables into one column. Uh, so the, the 12 punch would be in or out. And if it's in, it's a male. If it's out, it's a 
female. The 11 and 10 punch would have age, and the 987 punch might have number of siblings or this, that, or the other, what religion you were, okay? Mm -hmm. So computer couldn't read this damn card because it would have like six different things in one column. So Arlene and I spent a summer reading column one, code 12 to figure out male or female, put that one place. Then we went back and read the same column into the other and spread that out into a data set, sent it back to Stanford. So we were heroes at Stanford for making their data something they and we could use. Oh. So I'd, always, I'd always liked data. Yeah. But I, then I continued to use the consumer expenditure surveys and all. I didn't get into um, working on generating data until I was hired at uh, Chicago. And I came to Chicago as a professor in the education department and as a researcher at uh, NORC. Mm -hmm. um, NORC NORC um, it was a large survey research house one of the three large ones in the country at the time mm -hmm. um, and I was asked to come to Columbia, to Chicago partly to start a, a research center that would house Becker and Sherwin Rosen and mm -hmm. Jim Heckman Jim Heckman and Bob Willis, a number of people at Chicago. We had all been at NBER for most of our careers, mm. including Gary, who had been since he was at Columbia. And uh, NBER was moving increasingly toward uh, uh, Harvard orientation uh, with its president at the time, no longer Columbia, and, and really pretty energetically Harvard based and the Chicago fellows who all did their work through NBER were frustrated at the extent to which Chicago was relegated to like not as important because well NBER where they did their work oh yeah was affiliated with Harvard right so they asked me to come to NORC start a research center and they would all join me at NORC and leave NBER and so that's what happened. I went to Chicago partly because of NORC and to start an economics research center at NORC, bring economists into NORC, and then to teach. I had always taught, so I taught in the education department. And Gary left uh, NBER, Jim Sherwin, a number of people left NBER at the time. When you say uh, leave some, NBER, when you say leave NBER, what does that mean? That that doesn't mean I usually think of NBER as the as the research fellows and things like that, but you're saying well, they were earning a salary. Uh, it's where you put your research grant. You know, oh. we each we each had to apply for our summer funding from someplace, NIH, NSF, some organization, and you applied through some institution. Mm. Most of us, I know all the time I was at UCLA and at Stanford, I didn't put a grant through UCLA or Stanford. Or, I put them through NBER. Yeah. And what was the, the incentive folks, for you to do that? Uh, primarily, uh, economies of scale. By mm. putting mine there, then I, could, I would be interacting with the people that did work of the same nature that I did from across the country. Yeah. And we all put our grants at NBER, and so it was a wonderful opportunity. Then in the summers, we'd get to <clears throat> we'd get together, yeah. often working uh, at NBER West after a while, all summer long. People would come out from all over the country that had their grants at NBER. Um, you didn't you didn't have a higher salary in particular mm. than you would have had you put your grant through your organization. Another advantage, Scott, was that if I wanted to work with Bob Willis. And Bob Willis was at Stony Brook when I was at uh, Stanford. Where do you put the grant? If you put it at Stony Brook, hey, I got to have a subcontract to Stanford. If you put it at Stanford, same in reverse. If we put it at NBER, no problem. And we could add somebody else pretty easily. We had a lot of Israeli uh, buddies that worked with us. Uh, um, uh, and, you know, very easy to put everybody on the same grant, uh, Ruben Gronau, uh, whoever 
through NBER and you didn't have the hassle of going through your university's administration and explaining why your colleague who wasn't next door to you in your office but down the street 100 miles or 1,000 was the better colleague to work with on this. So it was just efficient. Right, but right. Uh, moving at all simply meant that starting in July of 1980, uh, I showed up at Chicago with a very large NIH grant that funded me, Becker, Rosen, uh, Heckman, Willis, Ed Lazare, wow. maybe one or two others for a, a five-year wow. grant That's... that I'd worked on before I came in order to get that thing going. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so was it, <clears throat> I mean, is it costly for all of you guys to withdraw from NBER given all those complementarities? Is that why you have to have a big group kind of? I mean, I, I don't fully understand everything we're talking about, but is it was it risky sort of to sort of say we're starting this other kind of a association or whatever? Well, I, I don't think any of us ever thought it. The risk would not have come to mind. No, okay. it wasn't risky. It, partly it wasn't risky for this reason, Scott. If we had not succeeded in getting our grants through NORC, most all of us expected we could have gone back to NBER yeah. the next year. Right. Okay. And so uh, it's more a matter of how good is the team you're working with? How right. successful will you be in the competition for money at NSF or NIH or one of the foundations? Mm -hmm. And we were very successful, but we were very good. Mm -hmm. So uh, the institution through which it was housed had more to do with this, uh, honestly, Harvard Chicago thing. Mm. And it wasn't a big deal. I don't think it was a big deal at NBER either. I'm sure they were disappointed to lose these guys because they were they were good. But mm. it was uh, just useful to have it at at home, yeah, across the street right. at NORC, and that yeah. allowed me to then start having influence with N NORC as mm. to the data that NORC had the capacity to collect and to compete, to uh, uh, generate, because, well, now we had this extraordinarily good group of economists, yeah. as well as the fine political scientists and sociologists and statisticians that NORC had had for uh, several decades. Wow. What, can you tell me some of the the data products that you're that you, you know probably would that, that you had a big hand in in uh, creating and sort of you know uh, administering over the years. Uh, sure, um, because that was a big part of my career from 1980 to the end. Um, Bob Willis and I did a survey that re related to the National Longitudinal. Uh, study of the high school class of 1986. Mm. And so we did a big survey of the marital and uh, uh, divorce social behavior of a group of people that had been followed uh, for quite some time. Uh, the NLS, the National Longitudinal Survey, had begun at NORC a year or two before I got there. Yeah. And that would have been soon the after, that would have been the 1979 NLSY. Are you talking about the NLSY? Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I got involved in it because it is a labor survey. It was right. done through CHRR, the Center for Human Resource Research at Ohio State University. Mm -hmm. They were the prime contractor. They were the instigator and planner and designer. And NORC was their field operation. Yeah. And once we got economists at NORC, we could participate with Ken Walpin and uh, the, the team at Ohio State in designing it as well as and, and using it as well as simply doing the field work. Mm. So I got involved in that quite early. Mm. And one of the more exciting data sets that was influential to me, and I think that um, broadly, in 84, before we began, it was fielded in 86, we did a survey of all the children 
oh, yeah. of the uh, respondents in the NLS, it's, the, the it's women. It's such an underutilized survey. I don't see a lot of people use it. It's wonderful. And it's used a good bit in sociology. Oh, is it really? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. And in fact, it was at the time crafted by psychologists. Mm. Uh, we brought a group of about six or eight first rate developmental psychologists to um, um, Washington, the National Academy of Sciences uh, hosted it, to design the survey of the cognitive and social emotional development of children, because we didn't know a squat about that. They yeah. did. Right. So we they helped us put together the child of the NLS, mm. and then we administered it, and then they promoted it among psychologists. I went to several psychology national conventions for years there talking about the child of the NLS as the, their senior people um, promoted it, used it, illustrated its value, and it has become... Uh, essential. So wow. that data set was wonderful. Then a couple of years later, th there, the British have always done better, uh, done a different form, and in many ways, a better type of longitudinal data than the United States. Oh. Starting in about 46, they started a data set, their birth cohorts, and it's everybody born in a week in England, Scotland, and Wales. Oh, wow everybody so the sampling oh, is a week and i forget that, that you know it's been some years yeah, since yeah, i've been doing I've never this, heard of anything like that that's really yeah, interesting oh yeah the, uh, so there, there was one in the 40s one in 58 one in 70 uh and the 58 i think it was birth cohort huh. study um as i was moving along early oh, 86 or seven or eight after we'd done the child of the nls i got involved with the british folks that followed their sample over a lifetime and we did a child at the ncds the national child development study with the same tests that we did to the american kids mm. identically that is it's so fun um one interesting thing, we had to go through all the questions and the math questions that had to do with nickels, dimes, and quarters. Uh -huh. They had to be changed in the yeah, pence. Sure. And, okay. And drugstore was not what, when they heard of a drugstore, it was not a pharmacy. Yeah. Okay. So we had to make it useful for kids in England. And we had to take it back to the psychologists that designed it in the United States to make sure that we didn't tilt it one way or the other. That was great fun. The other interesting thing that I won a NIH grant to support that, NIH, yeah. And I had to get, it was a million dollars of money to give to them to do the field work for the child. And I had to get State Department approval for what was called, um, what do you call it, you know, U.S. aid to England, uh -huh. because this money was going from the U.S. government to the British government, which yeah. was funding their survey. And we had a hell of a time getting permission <laughs> to get our money over there because we weren't giving aid to right. the United Kingdom at that point. But this million dollars had to get there. Yeah. So, yeah. so then that gave us identical data on British kids and their parents that were tracked over a lifetime with the U.S. kids. And the comparison of that has been a really uh, a wonderful uh, data set used by, again, psycholo psychologists and sociologists, mostly in England, but some here. And I've written two or three papers on that comparison of those two. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the, the next wave of the NLS, you know, the kids get older. The NLS is funded by the Labor Department tracking early entry into careers, uh, a job growth, uh, investments in training, how the labor department is working. Mm -hmm. Let's see, the, the labor market is working. So <clears throat> 10 years later, there aren't any young people in that data set. Mm -hmm. So you have to start a new one. So the 79 uh, was one, the 80, you know, we started another one 10 years later, and I designed that one. And that's the one I ran then for until I retired at 70. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so there are three or four of those going along. And uh, we've learned a great deal about the importance of training, job experience, uh, career growth, uh, mobility. It's been a, a terrifically valuable data set used by many, many people. I think you've yeah. used it yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. I wrote my dissertation on the 97 and LSY. Um, uh, the, the one that I, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear more of the story of the National Health and uh, the NHSLS. Now I can't remember exactly. National Health yeah. and how, Social Life there? Survey. Social Life Survey. Can you Anything, tell the story about anything. That? It couldn't say sex. Yeah. National right. Survey of Social Life. Okay. Because yeah. it was so politicized. You couldn't, if it had sex in it, it would be dead in the water. Okay. So tell the, for the sake of the reader, the listeners, uh, what is the NHSLS and what's the context in which that? I, the idea to create it came about. Yeah, it's a national sample in the United States of adult sexual behavior. It was motivated by HIV AIDS, mm. sadly. Um, at the time, AIDS was uh, identified and uh, the transmission mechanism through sex was understood. It became clear to the scientific community, health and otherwise, that we knew very little about sexual behavior. Mm. And that meant it was very difficult to anticipate where that awful disease would be heading, who would be most at risk, what would be uh, ways to perhaps anticipate its yeah. migration from one group to another. Mm. Uh, we knew precious little about sex. Yeah. Okay. I, and the reason I got involved uh, quickly was I was at that point still running a population research center. When you say we knew very little... Dr. Margo, when you say we knew very little about sex, this is like late 80s. Can you can you say a little bit more about, because in some ways we know tons about sex because we're having sex all the time and for the human history. But what do you mean by that, that we don't know a lot about sex? The statistical abstract yeah. has an index. There's a, you can look up, in the S's and you'll see sewers. And there are several pages of data about sewers mm. and, and sheep. And there are several pages or several tables that talk about sheep, how many, um, how sheep production has changed over time. You won't find sex in the sex statistical right. abstract. Right. We don't have data about sex. You may know your sex life and I may know mine and God, I'm pleased I don't know yours and that you don't know mine. Right. So it's pretty damn private and it ought to stay that way. Mm. But collectively, how many people have three, four, five sex partners in a, a month or a year? Yeah. When, when people have sex with the transmission of HIV, we know how it's transmitted. It's bodily fluids. Um, how many people use a condom? Right. Well, when do they use a condom? That is, do they have oral sex before they put on the condom? Mm -hmm. If so, AIDS can be transmitted. Mm -hmm. If not, much less so. Yeah. So here's a, a pretty, a pretty private fact about which we know zip. Mm -hmm. Okay. The reason we know zip is that it has been federal government policy. Mm. for one hell of a long time to know nothing about sex. What's the origin of that? Just uh, like uh, kind of uh, American, uh, Victorian kind Purit of? Yeah, just Puritan bullshit it would, it would be my answer. But uh, <laughs> that's why um, Alfred Kinsey yeah. is uh, something of a hero. Yeah. Uh, Kinsey was a wasp taxonomer. Yeah. He studied bugs and he he cataloged them and he got interested in cataloging sex and so he did this god awful huge number of people far more people than we ever surveyed yeah. um and asked all about sex and everything he could catalog he cataloged uh, amazing amount of stuff and yeah. all just like a wasp taxonomer curious about it fascinated honest 
put it down, share it. It would have some value to somebody at some point, including him in his thinking. He was no theorist. He was this empiricist. His statistical procedures were quite weak. Yeah. In fact, so flawed as to be really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and yes, he sort of knew that. And yes, there were ways in which he could have, should have done better. But that's not the, the key thing about Kenzie. Kenzie was passionate to get the facts and he put the facts together. But he got his money from private foundations because the government certainly wouldn't produce, allow it. Yeah. The, the Congress. His, his studies so, suffered from kind of some extreme selection bias, right? He would get. He would have respondents from seminars and there would be all this kind of endogenous sort yeah. of uh, back then the only people that would be coming to a seminar in the 40s or whenever it was on sex would probably not be as not not be representative of the american population at the time yeah uh so he had really skewed the, kind the, of the, the, the best population. the most favorable characterization is there it's a quota sample Mm -hmm. uh, and he had a quota. He wanted about as many men as women. He wanted, oh, mm -hmm. he didn't have any prostitutes. So he went to Chicago and found some prostitutes and interviewed them. He needed I, some, uh, some, you know, if he wanted some uh, Muslims, he'd find some Muslims and put them in there. So he ended up with a group of people that looked like it was representative because oh, it had see. the quotas. Got it. But they, you know, none of them were representative of anything. So the data might well have been accurate and honest right. in its reporting and in his presentation, but yeah. it was not representative of anything except the many thousand people in his data per se. Yeah. And that's the difference between that and a uh, statistically generated yeah. proper random sample that right. gives you so much power to study a whole population from right. a much smaller number of cases. The, but the, uh, the government threatened to take the tax exempt status away from the Rockefeller Foundation that was funding Kinsey. Mm. Okay, it wasn't simply that they wouldn't fund it. They didn't want it done. And they forced Rockefeller Foundation to stop funding Kinsey. Mm. And that destroyed his capacity to do his work. Mm. And ultimately, you know, his he his life ended just two or three or four or five years later because he could not continue to do his work because the federal government's stated policy was we do not want to know about sex. We do not want it known about sex. So when we first applied to do the study through NIH, they gave us a grant to design it. We designed it. Then they gave us money to do the sample, to do the survey, and the uh, government stepped in and said, no, we were by name written in the authorization for the year's uh, funding for NIH that no money from NIH shall be given to this group of people to do their study, whatever it's called, Nork. because they did was, not it, want they us named, to do it. They named Nork Na or they named you? No, me and Ed Lauman. Oh, goodness. And John Gagnon, because we were notorious because we were studying sex. <laughs> You're a hero. You're, it's incredible. So we had a wonderful survey instrument. Yeah. We actually had a good bit of money. Uh -huh. And we could keep the money we had, but they wouldn't give us enough money to actually do the survey. Mm. So what we did for a year was use the money they had and do 10 cases. But you could do 10 cases to improve your survey. So we do 10 cases, change a little bit, learn a little bit, do another 10 cases, do a little bit more. So we used all the money improving the instrument. Mm. So by the time we got five or six or seven foundations, uh, Rockefeller, also, Ford, MacArthur. You had to also do this with private funding? There was, no, there was no government funding for your NHSLS survey? There was for its design through uh, NICHD. Uh -huh. There was for its improvement as an instrument right. but there was no money for doing the survey several million dollars so we got the money from i i, I used to know them all uh but you know carnegie ford rockefeller macarthur and two or three others including some anonymous funding that were legitimate funders that gave us the money to do the survey so it was not government money that went in the field 
Wow. But it was all designed to understand um, where this disease was going. Mm. And it was the most exciting and just intellectually challenging thing in the world. How do you ask a random sample of people over the age of 18? Some are 19 year old virgins. Some are, you know, 40 year old nuns or priests or celibate. And others are old guys like myself now, I'm 80, uh, who maybe long since forgotten. So how the hell do you ask people a whole lot of detailed questions about sex? What word do you use for a penis? Right. Some some folks don't know the word penis, and you can think of ten words they might know for what that thing is. Yeah. Which which one do you use? And you're going to have to use the same one every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And you're using it on the 18 year old girl mm. and the 50 year old man. So what is the word? How do you describe it? What do you want to know? How how in the hell would you ever get anybody to tell you? Yeah. Okay. So we had. It was just the challenge of a lifetime to figure that out. Wow. And, and it, we, we got, I now have forgotten, but like 88%, something like that, of those in the random sample, and these are random, that is truly random. You reach in the urn, you pick out a first an address, or well, first a town, then a neighborhood, then an address. Mm -hmm. Then within the people in that household, you randomly select one of them. And that's the only person you can interview. You mm. can't take the husband because he's willing and the wife isn't. Mm. You can't take the husband or the wife if there's a 20-year-old kid and that's the one you pulled out of the urn. You have to do the one you got. We got 88% of them to sit down and talk to us face-to-face -face for an hour and a half about their sex life. Mm. And the, 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 the message basically was this. We need to understand sexual behavior in the United States in order to prevent the spread of AIDS. We as a nation don't know a lot about the statistical behavior mm. of the, our population. That's how you, you may, them yeah, up. and you may think AIDS is not of relevance to you because of your behavior and the way you live your life. And God bless you. Yeah. But you probably have nieces and nephews, neighbors and friends, and others for whom the health message and the health strategies that might prevent their dying from AIDS mm. can be informed by the information we need to find out about you. And you were selected, not because you're Scott, mm. but because you're the randomly drawn person that represents the kind of people you are. Mm -hmm. But all we wanna know is all about your sex life in great detail, honest, straightforward. And we promise you within two weeks of getting back home with the data you give me, we are gonna throw away your name and address and no one ever will know you are in this survey. We won't know, you will know, and you can be proud of it. Mm. But no one can uh, take me to court and get me to tell you because I'm burning your name and address two weeks after I leave today. And between the, now and then, you will likely get a phone call from my home office asking you if you, in fact, did the survey. Yeah, That's so we know the interviewers did real surveys. Once you say, yeah, I did the survey, your name right. and address is gone forever. Yeah, okay. And that kind of effort to persuade you to tell me, to persuade you that it'll never, you know, your estranged spouse cannot sue and get the information about those liaisons you had that you're not proud of, but I need right. to know, right. okay? And the other thing is, when we get down to, one of the way we did this, the last sex act you engaged in, we figured yeah. people would remember it. It might have been last night, it might have been last summer, but yeah. the last one is the most likely to be the one you remember. We're going to have to ask you gory details about that event. Yeah. And we're going to do that in a way, Scott, that I, the interviewer, won't know what you, the interviewee, tell me. I, you won't be able to either impress me 
or embarrass me. I won't know what you said. And here's how. Oh, right. I'm going to give, yeah. you a, give you a sheet, and it has, well, every sex act I can imagine, that our team could imagine, with yeah. a number or a letter, a letter. And I have several of these cards. And this is card E. So I'll give you one of these cards. I don't know which card I'm giving you. Now I want you to walk through your last sex act. What did you do first? Who initiated it? How long did it take? When did you move to the, sec the next uh, action you did? Who initiated that? How long did that take? What happened? How did it go? I'm writing down, you know, Scott did a little two, and then he shifted to seven, and his wife did that. And then when they got to nine, that was next. I have no idea what nine is. Right. Because it's on card D. But I have 17 cards here. So yeah. I don't know what the hell you're telling me. Yeah, and by yeah. the time it gets back home, they'll know it was card D. They'll look it up. They'll get it. But I won't know. You won't know. No one will know. And you and you will be erased. It okay. It seems like there's so much economic theory in this. Credible commitments, reputation. They believe that you're going to complete. They have to believe that you will make this impossible in order and you're doing it you believe that it's like a costly signal you, you, they if if, yeah. if they see you undertake this act undertake this they know that they can be completely honest they can reveal exactly everything how did y'all yeah. how was yeah. there, pre there was precedent i guess for asking sensitive questions that you and your team were sort of relying on the theory of this. Is that right? Or was there a lot of new theory for this? Less theory than uh, experience. The, mm -hmm. the team of research, of field interviewers at NORC have been doing relatively sensitive surveys on different topics for decades. Mm -hmm. So we brought 30 or 40 in and we had a blackboard. And we said, okay, we're gonna talk about penises. Let's put down here every word you can imagine mm. that you might hear someone say, well, I touched his da da da. Right. You've got to know what that is if, if in the part of the survey you're writing it down, you need to know, okay? So we had to first figure out and then uh, you know, cause everyone to not be embarrassed as we talked about all these things. And uh, in the end, it was just extraordinarily successful. We had many of the people we interviewed break down and cry near the end of the survey saying, this is the first time in my life oh my I've God. ever had a legitimate reason to talk about my sex life with anybody. Oh you know, I don't have a, I don't have a, 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 a counselor. I, I don't have an advisor. I uh, have my husband, my lover, my something, but you can't talk to him about some of this. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I can't really talk to my mother, my sister, my child. This is the first time I've ever thought about my sex life in the detail and in the rich way you're asking about it. And yeah. it's cathartic. It's wonderful. Thank you. It, that was the overarching experience we had. We don't... And, we don't think there was much exaggeration. Yeah. We don't think there was much underreporting. Yeah. We were stunned at how cooperative a random sample of Americans were. Uh, another reason it hadn't been funded, in addition to the fact that the government didn't want it done, was, and Kinsey had fallen into this too, you can't do a random sample. People won't tell you. So you have to get people that are cooperative. Right. We didn't have cooperative people. We had random, and mm -hmm. they were totally willing under the circumstances. Now, AIDS sure helped. Yep. Uh, two months of training helped every one of those interviewers. Yep. And then, of course, we went as many as 15 times to that front door, knocking on the door, asking, please, Fred, won't you sit down and give us the time? We can go, to, go out and sit at a a uh, coffee shop if you don't want to do it here we'd yeah. like to be alone with you for the hour if you want to bring someone sit on the other side of the room can't hear us to make sure this is legitimate oh and at the front door we my company had been to your police department here in oshkosh and if you want to call um sergeant smith 
at the Oshkosh Police Department, your policeman will tell him, tell you that I'm legitimate. Okay, so yeah, I'm asking you to do a quite an extraordinary thing. It's terribly important for the health of the nation. Mm. It was wonderful. You know, it's it's so interesting. I thought I had. I can't get out of my head now. Is like how what a model it is of of treating people with respect the kind of surveying you're describing and even thinking about kenzie just being so genuinely curious about an individual person's experience non-judgmental yeah going to such lengths to protect them to create a space where they can be exactly who they are you don't really think about that as the work of the the surveyor but it's really a it's really a moral virtue that we I, I try to personally I really believe that's a moral virtue to to um, to be non-judgmental and and genuinely curious about other people you know I, I so I know we don't know each other but because I read so much maybe I'm not really sure but but I read the social organization of sexuality several times in graduate Wonderful. school. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. I, my dissertation was on um, uh, gender ratio imbalances caused by um, mass incarceration and its effect on the African American uh, African American uh, couples and sexual behavior. So I was using the NLSY 97 uh, mainly as well as the NLSY 79 because you had the geographic identifiers and I could get I could get, you know, regional sex ratios. And, um, but then when I, when I graduated and I got a job at Baylor, I learned about um, uh, how online, uh, there, was a, there was a website where clients of sex workers would review the sex workers. It was this like platform. It was a lot like, it was like a platform. It was like Airbnb almost. It was like all these, huh sex workers and all these clients and they were matching through the website and i just decided i like it you know scraped it and i was doing uh in-depth interviews on the chat forum parts to learn more about how to write my own survey and uh to doing exactly like you were saying i was like well what do i say do i say prostitute or do i say what you know and they were like say adult service provider and so, so I ended up, I mean, it was very Kinsey like I, you know, didn't have a ability to do a random sample of sex workers. So what I did was I did an email survey of uh, the, the, the people that were the vendors, the sex workers on the website. And I got, it was just meant to be a labor survey. The thought was, uh, I'm not, I am genuinely curious about these people's, you know, their work life, their family life, their work life, their, how, their earnings. And so I wrote this survey that we call it with Todd Kendall, Chicago's PhD student. You know, he did his, he did his work under uh, Casey Mulligan. And oh. I think in the, maybe the, maybe, maybe the early 2000s. Anyway, he, um, he and I did this survey of 700 online internet mediated sex workers. It was the largest survey done. Wow. But, but I, I just, you know, I just feel like something you said was so many people have things that they want to talk about and nobody really asks and is safe and is genuinely genuinely curious and respectful of them as an individual person and the, yes. the 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 creation of a survey it's weird it how it can be so humanizing for a, for a person just to know that a person cares about their story like that yes exactly i completely agree with you non-judgmental curious and respectful you yeah. said it yeah it's exactly right well um i I want to um, I want to ask you one more thing, but I've got to stop for the um, for the, the the duration of the time of the podcast. I was wondering if we could do a little 
little bonus feature. I wanted to ask you about sexual capital, but I wanted to stop this uh, real quick and then um, thank you okay. for being on the 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 podcast. It was just mm. such a delight to hear uh, about your thoughts on these things and um, just this just this great example that you've you you have been for scholarship and for being an economist. I just really appreciate everything you've done and for uh, and for talking with me. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking with you and I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Thanks, Scott.